All right, everybody, we are back with section 10 of our research methods course. And in this one, it's going to be hopefully a relatively short section focusing on evaluation research or applied research. And just as a reminder, this is where you as the researcher are brought in by some outside company or organization, government agency, something with a specific research agenda or research project that is kind of their idea and information that they want for their own needs rather than you as the researcher coming up with your own plan and having to kind of figure out what your research question should be and so on and so forth. So let's get into it. Now, <clears throat> prior to uh, participating in any kind of evaluation research program, there are four areas you still have to consider, right? Number one, utility. Is it useful? Will it actually result in some benefit for some group of people, right? Um, is the research have good odds of providing some benefit, even if that's just um, proving that a certain program isn't working and we should stop wasting taxpayer dollars on it, right? Feasibility means, is it possible to even evaluate this, right? With, if you have a certain amount of time, a certain amount of resources, um, is it possible for you to really do a good enough job that you can get an accurate answer, right? Propriety is about whether it's ethical or not, right? We always, always, always have to abide by those ethical rules. And if some company or some organization comes to you wanting you to research something that you have ethical questions about, whether it's due to harm to subjects or um, how they might use that information that you gather for them, et cetera, et cetera, um, that is something that needs to be considered. Obviously, this should have been a problem with a lot of the um, you know mid-20th century studies financed by tobacco companies to try to show that cigarette smoking doesn't cause cancer. Those had obvious ethical issues, right? And then finally, the fourth one is accuracy. Can our results be shown to be accurate, right? Uh, are we actually going after the truth? Are the restrictions that the organization or whatever... Um, government agency, company, are we going to be able to get them accurate results um, within the limits of the situation, right? <clears throat> so those four questions are incredibly important before you really begin any kind of evaluation research. Now, there are different kind of features to evaluation research. The first is the input. And this is all the things you have at the beginning of the process, right? So um, when we did some evaluation research at uh, my university when I was in grad school about um, uh, noise complaints in a certain neighborhood, our input was, um, you know, the houses and residents of the neighborhood itself, the police patrol patterns and responses, um, the amount of noise being generated, right? Then there's the process. What are we going to change? What are we going to do? What are we going to, you know, how are we going to implement some new program, some new method of doing things, some new something, right? And then there's the output which is, has to be distinguished from the outcome. The output is always expressed in the same terms or the same units as the input, right? So if our input was certain police patrol patterns, our output will be the new different police patrol patterns based on the results of our process, right? The outcome is the change between the input and the output in whatever variable we're trying to measure, right? So in my example from just a minute ago, our outcome 
would be the level of noise complaints or the difference in noise complaints between our, our the pre-process step and the post-process step. In other words, our effect, right? Then we always, always, always have to get feedback, right? And feedback from those involved, feedback from the participants, feedback from neighborhoods or organizations that you're trying to change or help or modify. Um, you know, maybe we reduce noise complaints by uh, 10%, but by doing so, we also cause this unintended consequence that the neighborhood really hates. And now, even though noise complaints are down, they're less happy than they were before. We need to know that, right? And if we weren't specifically looking for that and measuring that, we might never know unless we go out and get feedback from that neighborhood and say, hey, are things better? Are things worse? Um, how are you feeling about these changes, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. And then finally, the last thing we need to talk about are the stakeholders. Stakeholders in any evaluation research are the people who have some kind of, you know, to use a colloquial phrase, skin in the game. These are the people or organizations that will be affected by this, that um, uh, have an interest in this process, right? So obviously the organization or government agency or whatever that hired you is an obvious stakeholder, right? But there might also be, you know, neighborhood groups might be stakeholders. Um, the other criminal justice agencies for that area might be stakeholders. Um, you know, there are all kinds of possible stakeholders who have an interest in this program and process. And we need feedback from all of them, right? Not, not just subjects, but all stakeholders, right? Everybody who kind of has an interest and, and has a, a say in how this process is going to work and what good means and what bad means and what improvement means and what non-improvement means. Um, all those stakeholders are very important and we need to be constantly getting information from them and input from them um, to try to help us make sure that whatever we're trying to evaluate or change or modify or improve uh, really has the results, uh, not only that we're intending, but that we're measuring, right? Because once again, just because we're measuring one variable doesn't mean we're not inadvertently changing more than one variable. <clears throat> now, when we're doing our evaluation research, there are kind of three different um, kind of standards that we can set or, or goals we can have for what we want to find at the end of it, right? That's the judgment-oriented uh, uh, evaluation, an improvement-oriented evaluation, and a knowledge-oriented evaluation. The judgment-oriented evaluation is relatively simple. Um, it's just, can we meet this goal, yes or no? Can we change this thing? Can we, um, you know, is there an improvement in noise complaints? Is there a reduction in crime? Uh, things like that. An improvement-oriented view goes a little deeper and says, okay, how much? Why? What, um, uh, you know, not just did we reduce crime, but by how much? Was it in uh, all different kinds of crime or only some kinds of crime, right? And then finally, knowledge-oriented is just, we're not necessarily trying to say, improve things or or make things better but i mean obviously that's going to be the ultimate goal but with a knowledge oriented approach we just want to learn more about how adjusting this affects this right um it's not necessarily we're going to put we're going to evaluate whether x is improving y for the better it's we're going to change x and just kind of see what happens to y we want to know what's going on we want to know kind of, you know, to help guide future research, future policy proposals, all that stuff. We just want to kind of learn more about how these things interact and what's going on in this system. Okay. Now, um, in addition to our actual 
uh, evaluation, we might also need to do, and in fact, almost always need to do at least some of these, uh, if not always, all of them, uh, of these kind of side evaluations, right? If you're a video game player, you can think of these as like side quests that are related to the main game, but not quite the exact same thing, right? <clears throat> So the first there is a needs assessment. Is there a problem here that really needs to be solved? Right? Um, do we really need to evaluate this for any reason? Will the results actually change anything? Or is this, you know, is this entire evaluation research that we plan to do just a big waste of our time? Right? So whether something actually needs to be done or not is a very important question before you actually spend all the time and energy and money to actually do your evaluation research. Second one there is the evaluability assessment. And that's, you know, where you determine whether it's feasible or not. That question from earlier in the section, well, if it's not obvious by just looking at it, then we might need to do some actual research to determine whether it's feasible. To figure out, you know, we have this budget, we have this amount of time, uh, we're able to gather data from these sources, but not those sources. Um, is it even possible? Well, we might need to do some, some basic initial investigation to determine whether it's even possible to really answer the question we are hired to answer, right? A process evaluation is all about kind of did the thing we were intending to do or change actually happen, right? So if our evaluation is on changing police patrol patterns, we might need to do a process evaluation to determine whether police patrol patterns actually changed, right? Because there might've been some disconnect. Um, some police officers might've just decided that they were gonna continue with their old patrol patterns for their own reasons and patrol patterns might not have actually changed at all, or maybe just not as much as we thought they were going to. So we need to make sure that this program or change or thing that we're trying to evaluate actually happened, right? We may hire somebody to teach kids about how to do a certain you know, job training or something, um, but if those classes never really happened, if that training never really, uh, that process never really completed or, or wasn't done right. Or, you know, the teacher instead just kind of took the money and messed around and showed a bunch of YouTube videos to the kids for an hour a day, instead of actually training them, we need to figure that out. So that's where the process evaluation happens. <clears throat> um, an impact evaluation is again, kind of looking at the output and determining not only what was the change, that we wanted to see or wanted to measure, but what are the other impacts? You know, if we actually did reduce noise complaints by 10%, is that actually making the neighborhood happier? Is that improving the lives of the citizens really? Is that actually having some kind of benefit for the neighborhood uh, above and beyond that one variable that our main analysis was actually supposed to measure. And then finally, there's the efficiency analysis. <clears throat> so this can be relatively complicated and there's two main kind of views on how to do an efficiency analysis. The first is a cost benefit analysis, which is entirely economic. What were the monetary or economic costs of the program? And what were the economic or monetary benefits of the program, right? So if we're reducing noise complaints, how much money does that save us in police time and energy and getting people to call and, you know, improved home values for the neighborhood and all that stuff. The second way to view it is a cost effectiveness analysis, and that's less monetary. So we still have the monetary or economic measure for the cost, but now the effectiveness is focused not just on the economic benefits, but also on the kind of quality of life benefits. Have we saved lives, right? It's really hard to put a monetary value on reducing the number of murders or the number of sexual assaults, right? Um, 
that brings far more benefit than just the economic benefit, right? So the problem is the cost effectiveness analysis is kind of a lot more difficult, a lot more subjective, a lot more values based than the kind of relatively easy, straightforward cost benefit analysis that relies entirely on the economic costs and benefits. Now, some other things we need to kind of decide on, hopefully at the beginning, are whether this is going to be a black box evaluation or a program theory evaluation. And this is all about whether you care how something works or whether you only care whether it works, right? So with a black box evaluation, we really don't care how or why something might work or not. We just want to know if it does. We're going to do some program, we're going to change some process or policy, and we're going to see if, if that has an effect on our outcome. With a program theory evaluation, we go further than that and we ask why. Why did changing this process or program or policy or whatever have this effect? Could we make it more of an effect? Can we learn something from this that might help us make this even better in the future, right? So obviously the black box evaluation is going to be relatively easier, um, much simpler, whereas the program theory evaluation where you're investigating all these extra things about how it's working and why it's working and maybe we can tweak this and get a little bit more out of it or, you know, make it cost less but still deliver the same uh, end result, same benefit. Um, and that's all going to depend on kind of who your stakeholders are and, and your resources and all those other factors are going to depend on, on whether you are going to be able to care about how and why something works rather than just does it work, right? Um, researcher or stakeholder orientation. This is kind of expressed as a binary, but it really is a continuum. And this is just kind of who, who gets to kind of lead the research process? Is it the researcher who, you know, is an expert in the subject? Or is it the stakeholders who are financing it and hired the researcher in the first place? You know, who gets listened to more? Whose values and processes and ideas and decisions are the ones that are going to kind of be more powerful and be more impactful in how this evaluation is done. And then finally, just simpler complex outcomes. Did we meet this goal, yes or no? That's a simple outcome, right? Um, complex outcomes might be, you know, did we, if we reduce crime, by how much? What crimes? Was it all kinds of victims or did it only reduce crimes for uh, young women? Did it uh, only reduce crime between the, you know, in nighttime hours, or did it reduce crime during the daytime too, right? So it's all about kind of how much detail you're getting into with these outcomes. You know, did this change economic behavior, right? So maybe the reduced crime in the neighborhood also increased economic behavior in that neighborhood, and now the the shops and services that are available in that neighborhood have seen a, you know, a, a rise in economic activity because crime's down, right? So how much detail and how complicated you want your outcomes to be measured, again, is going to be up to you. It's going to be up to the stakeholders. It's going to come down to resources and time and all those other factors. All right, so finally, ethics. There are a lot of ethical issues that are you know, applicable to all research, but need to be specifically pointed out when it comes to evaluation research. <laughs> so number one, it is very common in evaluation research to give benefits to some, but not others, right? So some neighborhoods might get increased police patrols and thus reduce crime, while other neighborhoods don't. Is that fair? Which neighborhoods should we choose to get this increased attention and thus better protections from crime? Um, if some people get new job training programs, well, who? 
who, who gets the new programs that are going to help them find jobs and who doesn't, right? If you're doing this in one county in a certain state, how do you pick that county? And how do you deal with the ethical issues of providing this help to this group, but not all the others that need it probably just as much, right? So there are some ethical concerns there, obviously. Um, there are sorted ways you can deal with this, like trying to give different benefits to others or by making sure that you start giving whatever benefit, if, you know, if this evaluation research results in conclusions that, hey, this new thing really works, how fast can we roll it out to everybody, right? Um, that's one way to at least mitigate some of those ethical concerns. Uh, there's the ethical concerns with the cost benefit analysis, as I kind of described a little bit earlier, where, you know, especially in criminal justice, it's really hard to put an economic value on things. Like if we reduce sexual assaults by 50%, there's going to be some economic benefit to that, but the real benefit of that goes far beyond economics. Goes far beyond, I mean, reducing the number of victimizations like that has, has way, way, way more than just an economic benefit. Although it does have an economic benefit, I want to make sure and point out. So how do you really quantify economically the fact that there are people who aren't getting robbed, aren't getting assaulted, um, not spending time in prison, you know, all those things. Third is political concerns. <clears throat> and this can be especially difficult if you're doing work for a government agency, but even, you know, a nonprofit corporation or a, or a, you know, so you have a for-profit organization, uh, there can be serious political concerns involved with doing this kind of research. You know, maybe you find, uh, you know, your conclusion is something that the dominant political party in your area really doesn't like. What are maybe the political fallout of that, right? If your organization that you're working for relies on government grants and your results are something that politicians of the area really don't like, is that going to threaten their grants? Are you going to have like cause them to lose a bunch of money. And that's just one of the many, many, many assorted political concerns that you might be having to deal with. Again, it's all going to depend on, on how and, and, and who and what subject and what research question and all those other factors. But politics definitely enters into play, especially in criminal justice, because that's such a political kind of hot potato right? Uh, how will the results be used? And just, will they be used at all? Right? Um, if, if you have the feeling that you're going to do this evaluation, you're going to find some result, and the organization that hired you is going to just say, oh, well, that's not the answer we wanted. We don't like it. So we're just going to ignore your results. Then is it ethical to even spend the time and energy and money and do all that to do the research in the first place? And even if you know they will use it, are they going to use it for to benefit people or to justify cutting needed services? Are they going to use it to demonize some at-risk group? Or are they going to use it to help this other group? Or, you know, so how are these results going to be used not only by the organization that hired you, but by the political powers of your area or uh, the news media or whoever um, might get a hold of them? And then finally, can you maintain confidentiality? Is it possible for you to publish results while still maintaining confidentiality, right? So any national study it's relatively pretty easy to maintain confidentiality. But the smaller you get, the more localized you get, the more difficult it can be to really maintain any kind of real confidentiality, right? So let's take abortion, for example. 
if we're looking at any large area or even any big city, maintaining confidentiality can be relatively easy. But if you go out to a rural area, very small county, and your data shows that there was one abortion during a certain calendar year and the person involved was a 16 year old African American female. Just that information alone, just those two little details might be enough for everybody in the area to know exactly who that was. Right? And now you have violated their confidentiality without giving their name, only saying that it was, you know, in this one county or one small area, uh, you know, age and race or, you know, height and hair color or what, you know, even little details with a small enough population can lead people to either A, figure out who it is, or B, and in some ways even worse, think they know who it is, even if they might be wrong, right? And either way, that re might result in negative outcomes and negative repercussions for that person who, you know, it might have actually been, or again, in some ways even worse, somebody who it wasn't them, but other people think it was, right? So if you can't maintain that kind of confidentiality, you might just not want to do it or report it in a different way or, or find some way to keep any of those details out of it to make it, you know, make it as impossible as it's possible for you to do to make sure that any confidentiality is actually kept and you don't have to worry about people kind of being outed, especially when it comes to things like criminal justice and criminality and, you know, uh, people committing crimes and protesting and vandalism and all kinds of stuff like that. That can be a really, really sensitive thing where confidentiality for researchers is just so important. All right, that's the end of this section. I really appreciate you watching. If you're still watching after all that, um, Thank you so much. I'll see you in the next one.